So I'll basically just talk a little bit about the articulation of my research and practice uh, because I, I consider myself not so much a sound artist but more of a, a researcher whose work kind of expresses itself through the arts and I'll talk a little bit about the reasons why as well but it's uh, what I will do is that I will kind of contextualize a little bit where I'm coming from with my work show a little bit uh, like three works that I'm not going to go into detail but kind of like set up the stage for the three works that I will focus on which are like the three most recent works that I've done that I've done uh, in since 2019 and also talk a little bit about the like what I see what I, I myself see as the kind of three sort of underlying themes um, of my, my research and work. And it's also like, also for myself, it's a, an interesting exercise because uh, what I'm doing here in Helsinki as a, as a postdoc right now, it's actually part of it entails also making sense of all the artistic work that I've produced in the past few years and, you know, uh, what I've been calling like deriving theory notes out of them. So trying to figure out what emerges from my work. So this is also, in a way, this, this talk here is a good exercise for myself too. So when I was outlining this talk, uh, I focused on like the, these three themes that I think are central to my research and practice. And I would like to start with uh, an interest in the material conditions of listening. That is uh, how sound becomes sound. So um, how we come to understand frequency information as sound, and that does not mean necessarily uh, constraint to the ability to hear, uh, but rather how the body perceives um, frequencies as sonic and vibrational information. Um, this material conditions of listening is of course informed by my uh, previous education, kind of like, it's, it, it philosophically is a bit of a clash between the Marxist and the post-structuralist perspective, but that's like for another conversation. But I'm really interested in how uh, the recording apparatus, the medium by which sound travels, and also the conditions in which any form of sound work is produced, be it music, be it um, archives, which is something that I also deal with, be, uh, be them also like everyday recordings, documentation, and also sound artwork, um, how it is, how the results, how we listen and how the, the results or the um, um, how it unfolds on space and through listeners bodies is also informed by the material conditions of its genesis of how it's recorded how it's reproduced and the institutions and infrastructures through which it travels so this is one thing that i think my work is deeply concerned with the other one is listening as a form of relation and relation with capital r here relates to yeah that's a terrible way of concatenating words but relates a little bit to the work of Edouard Glissant, which is a Martinique philosopher that writes about relation as this practice of not just grasping, like uh, as like this idea of enclosing knowledge, but rather the idea that to relate to something implies give in and give on to the, to the event. So how we encounter sound events and who we are and where we are and what informs this encounter, the conditions of this encounter. So the idea that the, even if I create some form of sound work, or as a listener you encounter sound work, it's not constrained by my own intentions, my own experiences as a listener, but rather that meaning is made in exactly in this relation process. And this relation process does not is not only constrained to like artist and listener, but rather is also informed by the historicity of the sounds uh, that I'm dealing with and or any other um, recorder or artist for the matter is dealing with. So the idea that listening is always a relational process and it's informed by cultural, political, social, and gendered, racial, um, constitutions that we are embedded within. And the last one, which is which concerns a little bit more the recent work that I've been doing, but I think it's also important, is the idea or the difference rather between legibility and detectability in listening. So what listening effectively produces about the body. Um, meaning that I'm 
actively brushing against the idea that sound is inherent to a body. So the idea that there is some kind of essentializing notion of what sound is, but rather that listening produces the body in the moment of listening. And to that, one of the things that I use to kind of like inquire the limits of legibility and detectability, and I will talk a little bit about these two things in detail later, is that I've been actively using notions of noise and distortion as a method. And I hope this gets clear as I talk. Um, my interest in the materiality of sound, as I, as I mentioned in the beginning, also comes because uh, of my training as a designer. So I actually study graphic design back in Brazil, uh, and my PhD is also in design, which is um, weird. I don't know why I stayed in design, even though I never considered myself to be a designer properly. Um, I've been working with sound and listening since my BA. Uh, I kind of like hacked or subverted my way through my graduation, my undergrad actually. Um, actually, I, my, my final work was actually a sound work, but I disguised this as a graphic design work. Um, so, but on the other hand, I don't think I will be doing this kind of work if I didn't have this all this training as a designer, particularly in the university that I studied in, in Brazil, which is a public university that has this strong um, philosophical view of what design is and what design does in the world. So um, I was kind of, I encountered um, a lot of uh, work, philosophical work that is not necessarily from design, uh, from the field of design, that basically helped me think design as more of like this thing that delineates material relationships. And I, I was able actually to make sense of it during my PhD uh, at the University of the Arts in, in, in Berlin, which I finished there in 2017. And I wrote about the material conditions of police violence and sound in Brazil. So how the Brazilian military police actively uses sound and sound sonic practices and listening practices as a justification for and also like a, as a as a, a, a vector for racialized violence in the country. So I worked um, with exploring how certain musical practices are criminalized, but also how the police also makes use of um, sonic tactics in order to um, exercise violence against uh, black and brown Brazilians. So yeah, after I finished my PhD and wrote all these things about police violence, um, I think I I started like thinking about what was happening in in terms of the political situation in Brazil, but how that would translate being in Europe, you know, because me being a Brazilian researcher, writing these things from abroad also grants me a certain privilege and a certain positionality to talk about those things. So one of the, the ways that I engaged with the, um, the topics that I was engaging with was actually, I was looking at media depictions of the violences that I was, that I was speaking about. So both in musical production, but also like documentation from the police itself, documentation from activists against the police and so on. And, you know, the, this transferability, this kind of like, um, if you will, um, continental transferability became a concern because I thought, okay, I have this position in which I'm seeing things from a distance and I have some kind of uh, emotional and personal relationship with that, but, you know, being physically far away also changes how I research and informs the, the outcome of my research. And that became some, some kind of like a, a, a thing um, that uh, more or less um, an active part of my work, starting with this work that I did with a friend, called, uh, an artist called Lucas Odahara, also Brazilian. We did this work in 2017 called Templos Verbais, uh, which was basically the, a collection and a mix of students' recordings of uh, like a massive occupation of schools that happened, starting in Sao Paulo, but then spreading all over Brazil throughout uh, 2015 and 16 and there was like um, a lot of recordings that the students themselves made from the occupations to kind of counter the the media narratives about them. I'm not going to go in detail about that but what emerged from this work is that uh, this is the installation that Lucas did. I didn't do the physical installation, I only did the sound composition. 
But what emerged from this was that we started questioning what does it mean to take these recordings, like they were all on YouTube and, you know, they were like very low fire recordings and meant to be public. And, but what does it mean to transfer them to a gallery space in which the listening conditions are completely different, not only in terms of like taking them out of the schools and taking them out of YouTube and putting them in a gallery space, but also taking them out of Brazil and putting them in Germany. And what does it mean to, you know, the conditions in which a protest emerges in Brazil are fundamentally different from the conditions of the emergence of a protest in Germany. So we started dealing with these ideas, but also it is, it is kind of a setback of the project itself because these questions emerged as we installed. You know, we, we weren't aware that these questions, these questions could emerge, but in conversation with, you know, listeners and with uh, curators and so on, it kind of emerged the fact that this transposition was important for the work itself because it it opened up this this positionality and this relation this relationality of listening that I was speaking about. So this work kind of is the last one that I did. it was in 2017 about Brazil specifically because then um, as I started like thinking about all those things that I just mentioned, uh, I came across this piece of news um, which is it was discovered there was a German uh, soldier impersonating an asylum seeker in Germany uh, and getting like all the state's assistance and so on as a Syrian refugee. But not only that, that this um, German soldier was planning a series of terror attacks that he would then place on his uh, Syrian identity. And this, you know, it's kind of like, okay, it's a really bizarre piece of news, but one thing called, uh, that caught my attention in this uh, whole investigation that was happening after they found this guy, Franco A, Franco Albrecht is his name, um, uh, is that why was he granted asylum? And one of the things that was determining for his asylum uh, granting was his uh, interview and language assessment. So, at the time, I was looking at all this idea that violence, like police violence, and uh, not only constrained to the institution of the police, but also like in practices of policing. And practices of policing also include um, borders, you know, the enforcement of borders, not only at the border itself, but what happens after people cross borders and want to settle in specific places. And this being in the midst of the so-called uh, refugee crisis, I don't like this term, but you know, like this is how it became to be known um, in Germany. It kind of called my attention because I saw like some some similarities of the stuff that I wrote in my PhD about how sound is instrumentalized to exercise violence and how insidious sonic practices can be into sedimenting certain certain assumptions about race, identity, and so on. That the idea of a white German soldier being granted asylum as a Syrian refugee through not only, I mean, it was not the only thing, but a big part of it being his language assessment called my attention. And not only that, but because the German government found that there was an error in his uh, language assessment, which was done in an interview, in a hearing, and then assessed by a team of linguists, um, that the German government used that as an excuse to introduce automated language and accent recognition. So instead of having linguists doing the work uh, of analyzing languages and accents of people asking for asylum, they replaced it with software. So for those of you who don't know, um, language analysis in asylum seeking cases is a technique that has been used since the 90s and it's usually like a, a third party company that does that. It's usually like two or three companies based in Sweden in the Netherlands that do that. The UK government relied a lot on the Swedish companies, but for instance, Germany had its own team, uh, Belgium I think has its own team and so on. But basically they record the asylum seekers interview and send this to a team of linguists who do an analysis trying to match the, the identity or like what the, where the asylum seeker claims to be from as to actually the person is uh, truly lots of scare quotes that is speaking that language. And this is particularly the case when asylum seekers come into a country undocumented. So they have no material proof that they are who they are. So, you know, when the state 
sees a deficit of papers that prove someone's identity, they rely on language as one of the tests to determine one's identity. And this idea of identity being tied to nation state, so, you know, that your voice, the language that you speak, ties you to a specific geopolitical location, has been a technique used since the 90s, done so by human listening. And then since the uh, end of 2017, Germany, so far as I, as far as I know, is the only country in the world doing that yet that replaced it with software. So the idea that then instead of having an interview recorded and then analyzed by linguists, the asylum seeker is called into a room, as you can see in these uh, drawings, and then speaks to a device like a microphone or a telephone for two minutes, and then the software uh, analyzes and returns the probabilities of a language being spoken. So the software actually takes uh, the role of the linguist in determining whether or not you are where you claim you are from. So the replacement of human and to, with machine listening kind of draw, drew my attention because not only because Germany used like a case in which uh, a white German impersonated someone else in order to gr be granted asylum and didn't even speak the language that he actually was supposed to speak, uh, but that they use that as a way to push this so this digitalization of the border uh, complex and the border industrial system that happens not only in Germany but also within the European Union at large. So um, there's a whole push for biometric border control, biometric border systems like that read fingerprints, irises, um, cell phone data, and in the case of Germany also um, speech. Um, so I became kind of interested in this idea, you know, that machines, machine listening can produce a truth about someone and this truth being external to the truth that the person themselves claim. Um, but at the time that I began researching this, I didn't have any funding to do that. And I wanted to do that as more of an academic research to begin with because, you know, I had just finished a PhD. But, you know, because of reasons that are external to me, uh, I got mostly artistic funding to do that. And this is the reason why so far I have only uh, or mostly produced artistic work about this topic. And in that, it allowed me to explore different things about this topic that I wouldn't be able to explore if I were only doing academic research about it. So it's kind of like um, uh, the silver lining of that, if you will is that um, the lack of academic funding allowed me to explore different areas of many aspects that interest me in this process of automated speech and accent re uh, recognition. So just to be clear, what this software does is not to identify the person uh, speaking, but rather where the person comes from. So it's not identification, it's classification. So this, this process is a different process than identification in which, you know, voice, voice prints, for example, in which uh, personal home assistants are kind of experimenting doing like Alexa, Google Home or whatever that, you know, kind of match your voice to a profile of you as a person. The software actually ties your accent or your pronunciation or your prosody to a specific geopolitical location. So it conflates a little bit national identity with territory, which is, which is an interesting um, blurry zone that um, my work also uh, questions and challenges. So I started doing uh, like some notes and, you know, kind of researching further because it's also like since it, it, it concerns a, a public body and um, questions of national security, if you will, um, there's not so much information available about what this, how and what this software actually does, but thanks to uh, Freedom of Information Act in Germany, some information has been released, like these two things that you're seeing right now is part of like a, a leaked series of documents that the Federal Office for Migration and Refugees um, circulated amongst their staff and it got into the hands of a few journalists and they released that publicly. And I will comment a little bit more about that later. So I started collecting this information and, um, you know, because of the Freedom of Information Act, they were uh, forced or obliged to review how many times this test, this software testing has had taken place by the time of the, that the question was posed. So if you see in the beginning, 
uh, in the in the top of this image. Uh, this is the last time that the um, German government released information about this, so it's 2018, so it's quite old. And back then, so it was less than a year of uh, the software being in place, it started in November 2017. Um, there were already, like if you see in the bottom, bottom right corner, um, was almost 10,000 asylum cases in which uh, accent recognition software was used. And they didn't disclose how many of these were su successful, how many of these kind of um, confirmed the asylum seekers claim, how many of them uh, contradicted. This was released later, but still they are very um, sketchy about this. They don't review precise information. They say they don't have a way of you know, keeping track of this. But this number is quite scary uh, because it means that you know almost 10,000 people had um, the kind of decisions made about their lives that were partly taken by software without any accountability whatsoever. So there is no, you know, there is, uh, of course, you can uh, contest the decision. But, you know, if any of you that is listening now know how asylum processes work, this is extremely difficult and uh, exhaustive, exhausting, sorry, exhausting um, legal work that has to be done in order to contest these, these decisions. Um, not only that, but in another um, Freedom of Information document that they disclosed, they said that the error margin of the software was 20% at the time, which is a lot. So it means that from these 10,000 cases, almost, almost 10,000, almost 2,000 cases were probably wrong. You know, so it's a lot when you think about this is deciding upon people's right to dwell, people's right to, you know, stay, especially people who have uh, flown like conflict zones and have, you know, nothing else. So it is really a violent mechanism in which voice and especially accents, like especially things that are particular to one's own body uh, and one upbringing and one cultural uh, uh, upbringing and also one's own history of traveling, uh, how how much importance is given to that, how, how that becomes something that is used against you and instrumentalized by a governmental body, such as the Migration Office. So the first thing that I did was, I know, I mean, this image is boring. The problem with working with sound art is that loudspeakers are very boring to document. <laughs> Um, but the first piece that I did about this uh, whole research project was at Akud in Berlin. It was, it was in the courtyard of Akud, and I used these PA speakers. There were three of them, and I decided to do like a very tongue-in-cheek installation in which I basically had text-to-speech software uh, reading all the press statements that the Federal Office for Migration in Germany released about that neo-Nazi soldier case. And in which they try, you know, they try to, you know, have a mea culpa saying like, oh yeah, we did it wrong, you know, yeah, that was, that was horrible, you know, all those things. Uh, but one thing caught my attention is that they, they said in one of the documents, das hätte nicht passieren dürfen, which means it shouldn't have happened. And, you know, this kind of like this lame, it's kind of like a non-apology, kind of bother me. And I created a piece in which I, I not only had like the, the text-to-speech reading this, this, this statement, but I kind of composed them to, uh, to every time they said something that in my personal uh, assessment of that sounded stupid, I made them say right afterwards, das hätte nicht passieren dürfen. So they say like, yeah, we are now uh, analyzing 10,000 other cases in which this might have happened, and then that this shouldn't have happened, and so on and so forth. So this was a three-channel installation using basically computer voices, uh, speaking in German, so I also probed this idea that they, they probably chose like the quote-unquote most neutral accent of German, which is uh, like probably like some weird form of Hochdeutsch, like Hanover, whatever accent. Germans will definitely contest my, my, my statement right now. But, you know, this idea that there is like a, a computer, a computer voice has to be a, the most neutral version of that language as possible. This was an interesting piece, but it was very like, it was very flat. So that's why I'm not playing it. Um, but it was, it was an interesting thing to do just to have these three voices kind of occupying the courtyard in this very dystopian kind of scenario. And, you know, to the borders of um, natural and artificial voice being played 
very loud in the courtyard. So this was the first piece that I did. The second piece that I did is that I turned the, this on, on its head and kind of did like the opposite. So uh, I was commissioned by the Goethe Institute in Brussels to do um, a piece about the, my research. And what I did is that I analyzed the documents that asylum seekers or like the folders, the, the paperwork that the asylum seekers get when they arrive in Belgium, uh, focusing on what is asked from them in the hearing. So what, what should they say? How should they behave? And et cetera. And what will be done? with uh, the recordings of their hearing if case if the case need be um so i had this um kind of semi-professional choir which is called brussels experimental so uh, led by floris lamens the, the person at the at the left and i asked him to to uh, select people in his choir that were from belgium or uh, and had a, a migration like history so they were like um sons, daughters of migrants, or they had moved to Belgium um, like at an early age or recently, but you know, they, that they were Belgian, but not like uh, um, European Belgian, so to speak, you know, so they had like other, other forms of uh, heritage that um, could um, place them outside of what is commonly seen and perceived as being like Belgian, you know, so, and they had like two of them were Belgian, the, the, the one in the middle, the, 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 the person in the middle is from Afghanistan, had recently arrived in Belgium uh, as an asylum seeker, turns out, but um, that was not like something that I, I was looking for. But what I wanted is that to have people whose, um, whose, own, hist uh, whose own history of being in Europe kind of crossed along these borders of what does it mean to be Belgian in this case. So they would they would identify strongly with being Belgian, but that's not the case when Belgium looks at them necessarily. Uh, and these were all amateur opera singers. And what I had with them is that I had them sing the documents from the Belgian government, uh, kind of like mocking a little bit the language in that. So they were like doing like syllable like se separated in syllables, and you know almost like as machine readable phonemes. And we did a piece that basically had like a, a counterpoint uh, composition in which all these phonemes became almost um, unrecognizable, but they were saying things that stemmed from both from the documents, but also saying things um, uh, that kind of complicated a little bit the meanings of those documents. It was also an interesting piece, um, but I don't think it's relevant to kind of show examples of how it sounded like. Um, if there is interest, I can send a recording later. But it was it was a, a very interesting thing to do because it also um, probed a little bit on the opposite process of what I did in the Akud piece, which was to reverse a little bit this idea of or this process of um, human input and machinic output, in this case was more or less machinic input and human output, kind of mimicking, mimicking and mocking this language in a way. So after I finished that piece, um, I got a grant from the city of Berlin to do re uh, artistic research. And at the same time, I was also commissioned by the CTM Festival and the uh, Deutschlandfunk, so the German radio, to do a radio piece about my research. And this allowed me the uh, like time and money to go a little bit deeper and give myself more time to dive deep into the research aspect of it. And going back into what, what was happening in the asylum seeking process, I found out, and someone had already pointed out to me, but you know, I went a little bit deeper into the fact that Germany had already experimented with accent recordings a hundred years uh, prior to this uh, asylum seeking process. So in the beginning of the 20th century, the, the, the Prussian Empire created the call, the, the Preussische Phonographische Commission, so the Prussi Prussian Phonographic Commission, led by uh, Wilhelm Dögen, a linguist, a very famous linguist, um, who basically, in, in, he had a phonograph, which was very new at the time, so we're talking about like very early 20th century, and he went, he traveled across Prussia 
going to World War, World War I prisoner camps and recording prisoners of war. So he wanted to create the biggest accent library in the world. So he basically, since Germany had so many prisoners of war from everywhere, um, he wanted to record these people's accent and catalog them and make us like linguistic assessments out of them. And basically this is forced labor done to prisoners of war. And the fact, there's also the fact that many of these prisoners of war, many of them were soldiers coming from at the time, colonies. So you had soldiers coming from Martinique, soldiers coming from India, soldiers, soldiers come from Nepal, all places which were at the time French and British colonies that were there in Europe fighting their colonizers' wars. So there is a lots of these recordings are actually from Martiniquean French, are from um, uh, you know variations of English from India, and also some. Uh, some Creole French and other, other languages, also some dialects from um, specific ethnic groups in France, but you know, there's a big, uh, like a big chunk of these recordings is actually from colonial soldiers. And that, you know, immediately clicked in, in, in me that there is like this temporal connection of 100 years of Germany trying to make sense of someone's accents and, you know, provide some sort of cataloging, some sort of, you know, deciphering, some sort of translation to that and tying them once again to country and identity. In the case of, of course, the, the Phonographic Commission, there was no, like, uh, use of those accents in, in border enforcement, but Instead, they went through the process of academic study and anthropology and, you know, all these disciplines that have a strong colonial history and a very violent history for that matter. So I started looking at these recordings and they, all these recordings are available at the Humboldt University in Berlin. And I figured out that the, the connection was not only temporal, but was also spatial. So this is the König Friedrich August Kaserne. It's in today's uh, Chemnitz, former Karl Marx Stadt. Um, and I focused on this specific uh, uh, prisoner, prisoner of war camp because it was by the time that I was doing this was the time that all these Pegida, these white supremacist marches were happening in Kamenitz. And not only that, but because a lot of colonial soldiers were also ordered in Kamenitz and in Wunstorf, so these two camps, but I decided focusing on, on Kamenitz because of this uh, connection with what was happening at the time, like all these marches, these neo-Nazi marches. But then I figured out that the König, König Friedrich August Kaserne uh, was abandoned, is still abandoned, but um, this is how it looks like today. Uh, this is a photo that I took. But in fact, it is like eight, an eight minute walk from a current refugee center in which this accent testings are taking place and were taking place at the time. So you see like the Google Maps uh, kind of kind of thing. So there is also the spatial connection and you know it's not by by accident that these things are close to one another because many other uh, prisoner of war camps have been converted into refugee centers. So the connection was not only uh, temporal, like 100 years, exactly 100 years apart, but also spatial. And I used that connection to do the piece that uh, Deutschland Funkkultur and CTM Festival commissioned me to do, um, which is, uh, I will play you in a second. Another thing that struck me was that this, these were the forms that the Prussian Phonographic Commission did uh, when they took the recording. So they had like the type of recording, the date, the um, birthplace of the person being recorded. And then in the end, I don't know if someone that is listening can uh, speak German, but you know, in the bottom right corner, you have the assessment of the specialist. And in this case, if you look like a little bit, this was by Wilhelm Dürgen himself. And then he does uh, an assessment of the voice. So he says it is a, a clear and strong voice with a good, uh, good pronunciation of consonants in a way. So that's more or less what it says. So there is like this, this external assessment of someone's, uh, someone's voice and someone's uh, dialect or, or accent that is being recorded for being uh, catalogued, taxonomized and studied. And these are the forms that the, the Phonographic Commission did, but then I got access to the kind of documents that uh, caseworkers 
get when asylum seekers are tested with the software and this is how it looks like. So it bears some resemblance in this idea of like, you know, assessments and kind of breaking down into characteristics of speech. But what is different in this case is that the, the accent recognition software gives you probabilities. And these probabilities are distributed across a spectrum. And so they do not tell exactly what's happening, but they tell the probability that this is happening based on the duration of the recording. So you see that from 58 seconds, only 22.5-ish seconds were usable. And you know you have all these other technical details. So there is also like this bureaucratic connection in what, uh, what language becomes once it's recorded. And you know all these details ended up being parts of the, the piece that I did, which is a, a series of gaps rather than the presence. It's narrated in German, but in, on my website I have a PDF of the, um, of the voiceovers that I did. And I think um, before we play a piece, I know I'm speaking a lot and we're not doing so much listening, but um, before we, we listen, I just wanted to say a little, uh, a few things about it. So I had like this trio of singers with me and I was also playing like electronics and uh, doing the voiceovers, but this in the end became sort of, so it's 41 minutes long and became kind of like in between an essay and the play like a the theatrical kind of thing but also some degree of sound composition but important for me was that all the voices that I wanted to have in this piece would have some form of um, engagement with language that was uh, not expected so the piece in itself it's in four or five languages so it's German English Arabic uh, Kurdish so it's four languages, so German, English, Arabic, and Kurdish. Uh, and except for the German part, there is no, no translation involved. So I also wanted that idea of languages being not immediately decipherable, not, being avail not having everything available in the piece for everyone, a big part of it. So um, I think we can listen now to um, the first track in which I have like this kind of like more theatrical or kind of like playful idea of um, working with the three singers is just the three singers and having them narrate facts but in a very opaque and obscure manner about the temporal and spatial connections. It's in German, so um, just bear with me, but it's like the first part um, that I wanted to play, if we can, please. So, um, as I mentioned, like I had these three singers, um, so Enana, uh, Leo, and Mariana Bahia. So two of them from Syria uh, and one from Brazil. All of them speak in German and, you know, with their own accents, their own pronunciations. We had like minimal uh, correction just to ensure like some, some things were not like missed and, you know, because, of course, we wanted also to communicate the content, but the whole idea was to have all voices in the piece being, you know, immediately, like, noisy for your, your, your average German listener. You know, I wanted to give them this, to the listener, this kind of, like, uncomfortable moment in which the listener is, you know, being confronted with different pronunciations. And... I also let them sing, you know, so the, there was this moment in which I let them improvise and do this kind of call and response and find their own melodies into that because I also wanted to give them some autonomy as to respond to the whole research that was done because, you know, from the three, Enana, um, they had gone through the asylum seeking process. Uh, no, I think Leo as well, both, both have had gone through the asylum seeking process, although like in different capacities and none of them going through this language testing, but they were aware of the, the, the violence and the whole, you know, bureaucratic nightmare that this can be. So I also, you know, in inviting them to be part of the piece, I also wanted to give them space to uh, improvise and to let their own their own joy take part of the piece as well. You know, um, there's 
before we listen to the second part, so just a, a technical thing, I, I did like three recordings of this, but I think I would just listen to the next one in a couple of seconds. Uh, the third one will be too long. But this third one you can listen to in the Deutschland Funk Kultur, it's available online. I think the, the part that is worth mentioning is that Leo, he's, he is a, a rapper, a very good MC, and in this configuration he was kind of the MC as well because he was the one of the main narrators and kind of the storyteller apart from me I'm, I was kind of giving the you know the the sort of uh, more academic talk but he was narrating the story mostly and in the end uh, he composed a verse in Arabic uh, about the piece and then the second part, so there are two parts. The first one is a verse that he composed in Arabic. And the second part, he recites a Kurdish poem, a Kurdish revolutionary poem. And, you know, I haven't given any translations of that to any listener ever because I don't want to. I think certain parts of the piece are not accessible to average listeners and that's fine, you know. And that's kind of something that I wanted to be part of the piece, like preserving and uh, letting, in this case, Leo, um, retained his right to 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 communicate only to to the people that he wants to communicate um as being a, a fundamental aspect of the piece and i do that in the in another piece as well that i will talk later another thing that emerged in this piece um i'm, I'm not talking about about it because it's like it's a 40 minute piece and there's a lot of things happening in there but it's also dealing with this archive that i was talking about these recordings from the phonographic commission and one thing that is important to my practice is that how to deal with this archive. What does it mean to listen to this archive and to kind of introduce a different listening or a new listening to these archives? You know, it's not, it's not just me reproducing something that has been recorded under forced labor conditions, but rather that I am responsible for the moment of listening. You know, as an artist, as a scholar or whatever you want to take, uh, there is a certain degree of accountability of dealing with these archives and the way that you present them and the way that you introduce a new listening to them matters for how, um, if, if you want these archives to tell the story that you, you want them or you let them tell, which is not the, just the reproduction of the violences by which they were constituted. So this next bit that I want to play from this piece kind of does that by juxtaposing one of these recordings with the current documentation from the Federal Office for Migration and Refugees about how the speech test should be conducted. So I'm just juxtaposing these two recordings and, you know, asking the listener what is in what what is there in this juxtaposition that, you know, tells both stories at the same time and lets a third emerge, which is, you know, it's kind of like this, not a, like Germany failing to attend to its own history. So if we can play the next bit in which these two recordings are juxtaposed and then we move to the next piece. So, uh, so I think I've taken a lot of time already, um, but I will just uh, speak a little bit about this piece and then focus on the latest one, which I think it's more interesting for for now, because this one can be, this one that I'm showing can be accessed, fully accessed online. But this is, so after I finished that piece, I went to do a artistic research uh, residency in Sweden, in Stockholm, at, as part of the YASPIS. And while there, I was lucky enough to be also uh, a guest composer in the Electro Music Studio, which is one of the oldest uh, electronic music studios in Northern Europe, if I'm not mistaken. I, I, it exists since the 60s. And there I had the, the, the chance to work a little bit more with this idea of the archive. So basically what I'm doing is that I'm looking at this phonographic commission uh, recordings, which are, you know, treated already as an archive. They are part of a university's archive. But I'm also considering the databases that the, um, the software is trained with, so how it learns how to recognize specific accents. I'm also training these databases uh, as rudimentary forms of archives. Basically, the German government has bought a couple of um, collections of speech recordings, like telephone recordings. These are done consensually. These are not like forced labor, um, although one can inquire the labor conditions by which this happens. But um, they bought uh, a couple of da databases from the University of Pennsylvania, um, namely one database that is called Call Home. Uh, which is basically phone recordings of people that uh, lived in the United States but are, have their families elsewhere. 
And specifically, they bought the, the first one that they bought was the Egyptian Arabic variation of it. So they used, they trained the software with it first with Egyptian Arabic, and then they added other variations of Arabic. But you know, I, I was thinking about the these databases. I was treating them as as archives because they were recorded in the early 2000s, and they are a temporal also. Um, snapshot, if you will, of Egyptian Arabic. So they are not definitely not a statement of, about how Egyptian Arabic sounds today, because, you know, language more or less, even though it's a short period of time, they undergo certain forms of mutation, especially with younger people, especially after the so-called Arab Spring in 2011. So there was a lot of uh, changes uh, that, you know, probably are not measurable and are not concerning measuring the, with, with measuring those changes, but definitely, but more with the fact that a database that was recorded like 20 years ago is being used to test languages today uh, without considering the whole sort of geopolitical and, and um, cultural changes that countries go through, especially with this crisis that, that, that was taking place at the time. So I was treating those databases archives in a way. And I had access to a, to a couple of files from it, um, like a couple of these telephone recordings. And I started working with them uh, in the, in the, with using the, the infrastructure of the, the studio in, in Stockholm. So I was using this gigantic bookless synthesizer to do that, which has like this spectral filters. And this kind of spectral kind of parsing or, or um, filtering is more or less what the software does technically speaking, you know, it's not, not exactly the same, but it bears some resemblance in terms of the techniques that it uses, um, except that the, the software does that, you know, as in the frequency domain, it's kind of like Fourier transform all these digital transformations. Um, but, you know, the idea that I could have like this really powerful um, uh, multi-frequency -fre filter, bandpass frequency, uh, bandpass uh, filter, kind of got me thinking about how to treat these materials um, and kind of zoom in into specific aspects of these recordings instead of like just playing them as they are. So what I did throughout this um, research process was to manipulate these archives, these this databases, uh, find out specific sounds, and in this case I was focusing on so-called paraverbal sounds. So, uh, sounds that are not um, verbal or extend a little bit the verbal meaning of, of, a, of a specific word, such as hesitations, um, cuffs, breathing, um, lip smacks, which was my favorite one, and breathing sounds and so on. Things that in the database, they are annotated in the transcription, they are annotated so the software can ignore them. So I started like just making this cuts of these specific uh, sounds and using them as inputs and using like techniques such as granular synthesis and this um, spectral filter from the Buchla to generate kind of really deep zoom ins in textural parts of those those voices. And at the same time, I did like this for the open studios at Yaspis, I did this sort of semi-generative composition using like this Eurorack thing. Uh, and, you know, it got me thinking about uh, ways of presenting these sounds, again, thinking about the responsibility of presenting these sounds in a different context, but also exploring like the timbre qualities, not only of the voices themselves, but also the medium through which they were recorded in this case, like over the telephone. So how the telephone already filters out lots of frequencies and in a certain way affects the quality of speech. Uh, and, you know, also transposing them to a different medium, to a different technique and so on. So then I got uh, a grant from the Schloss Solitude and ZKM in Germany to do a so-called web residency. And I did this project called on the apparently meaningless texture of noise uh, in which I started working with this way of zooming in, so like granular synthesis and spectral filtering as a way of zooming in into this timbre and textural qualities of, of voice. Um, not necessarily divorcing them from where they come from, so it's not just presenting those voices as if abstracted from where they come from and what they mean and what they are used for, but rather contextualizing these kind of exploration of timbre and texture in the process of accent recognition and accent classification software. 
So what I did is that I created like a series of loops, like two minute loops, and uh, again, layering, juxtaposing and working with um, a repetition. But I also did some sort of spatialization of them uh, using ambisonics and binaural um, techniques. For that, I was using back then the structure of the um, of the studio in Stockholm. But then to transpose into this web environment, I had to rely a lot on you know um, my design skills and programming skills to make it like more or less work. This is. Um, Online, you can you can navigate with headphones, and as you move the the mouse around, it kind of respatializes the whole composition. But more importantly for me was that I wanted to treat this as an essay. So each composition has its own um, kind of meaning, abstractly speak abstractly speaking, but also that they pertain to a certain kind of step of the process that I wanted to talk about in each so-called chapter. And also to use the web space of this project as a, um, as a repository for certain documents. So like these documents that were leaked from the, the migration uh, office, I wanted to, to leave them available for download in this essay. So using this essay also as a repository of all this documentation that is very difficult to find. You have to navigate through a lot of German um, bureaucracy and 90s web design in order to find this file. So I have them and I wanted to put them online in a way that is, you know, kind of you know, not ex not explicitly kind of sharing them, but making them available nevertheless. So I, I brought like for us to listen to two loops, but it's more interesting if you later access the essay itself and navigate through the through the loops yourselves. Um, but just so you know how it, a little bit how it sounds like, we can listen to maybe just one, maybe just the first of the loops. So I have time to talk about the last project. Yeah, I think it's okay. I mean, we, we are kind of running a little bit of our time and I wanna talk about the other project. Um, if you are curious, I, I think it also sounds better if you access on the project itself and you also get access to the documents and so on. So this is kind of like parts of the essay. So I was working with like descriptions of images um, and putting all these documents available for download. Um, this project was awarded uh, with the hash award by the ZKM in Karlsruhe. So it means that I have a little bit of money to actually make it larger. So I want one of the things that I want to do this year is actually to make this a proper archive and expand this idea of a sound essay and do a better programming of these things, you know, actually hire someone to do the programming for me. Um, but I, I'm, I'm grateful to have this opportunity of turning this project into an actual archive and play a little bit around with the idea of what a sound assay can be and what kind of purpose it can serve in terms of, you know, the, the topics that I want to talk about, because it's, it's not only the aesthetic exploration that I'm doing, it also has a, a very strong uh, and timely political component to it. Um, so I wanted to finish by talking about this project that I finished um, November last year. Uh, it's my most recent project, uh, done in the context of the residency at the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics in Frankfurt, in Germany. And uh, this, this work is called There is a Point at Which Methods Devour Themselves, which is a quote from uh, Franz Fanon, in which he's actually talking about how methods sometimes only serve themselves, uh, especially in, in this idea of otherings and you know, um, what, what does it say about people and about bodies that are always assumed to be like from a white Western male cisgender heterosexual standpoint. So Fanon was inquiring like the point at which methods cease to function and methods only become things in a, a, for the sake of themselves. And while I was at the Max Planck Institute, that did, this became a question. As I said in the beginning, I was really interested in the material conditions by which sound emerges in a space and what does it mean to listen to sound in specific spaces and what does it mean to uh, to produce certain degrees of truth by listening, which is basically what the accent software does by delegating it to machine listening, but what language assessment in general does is kind of like using the conditions of listening. So when a, when a, an interview is recorded or when you know an asylum seeker has to tell the story for, I don't know, the millionth time, and using that this this 
production of sounds as a way to, to, to kind of generate a certain degree of truth, which is always external to the person themselves. One of the things that emerged during my research for the series of GAPS piece was that the, the things that the prisoners of war were asked to, to record or the story that they were asked to tell was the story of the prodigal son. So it's this biblical Christian story of the son who leaves home and then loses everything and then returns home for the unconditional love of his father. And I found it really interesting that they were asking prisoners of war to tell a story about returning home. And one, another thing that emerged was that the test that takes place nowadays in the asylum seeking process um, is also done by describing an image to the software. And this image is of a family having dinner at home. And it's mostly a Muslim family. So it's again, evoking this notion of home and more importantly that home is always someone somewhere else it's not germany you know home is something that you have to return to eventually so especially the tale of the prodigal sons st struck me as as interesting because you know these were colonial soldiers and most of them had christianity as an imposed and oftentimes very violently imposed religion uh, and so i decided to focus on the story of the prodigal son and then inquiring these limits of you know, what a voice produces and how, how much we can read and detect in a voice. Uh, I focused on a Brazilian song from the 80s about the prodigal son, but recontextualized in a you know, kind of um, countryside, deep countryside, Northeastern Brazilian history. And this Brazilian song is really beautiful and tells the story in a very kind of folk slash popular way, but very uh, uh, contextualized within Brazilian history. So it's not immediately accessible in terms of meaning to, you know, listeners elsewhere. But more than, uh, more than that, I asked a singer with no knowledge of Portuguese whatsoever to learn the song and to record it without giving her the words. So she had to learn by ear and reproduce the song uh, in any way that she understood. I didn't correct anything. I didn't tell her anything about the song. She had to kind of rely on her own listening to produce her own interpretation of that song. Uh, so we recorded her singing. These are her notes. So she's Greek, she's originally from Greece, and this is how she notated the song, uh, which I think is also fascinating. Um, and after I recorded her, what I did was to kind of completely deconstruct and reconstruct her voice. So basically what I did is that I kind of selected specific frequency bands from the recording. And these frequency bands were, I was not like arbitrary. I used measurements from the room in which the work would be exhibited in. So we did like a really a series of measurements in which we, uh, we kind of identify the most resonant frequencies of, of that room. And I selected specifically those frequency bands, of course, like with some give and take uh, from her recording. And I did basically, in technical terms, what I did was basically process her voice through a phase vocoder. So I reconstructed these frequency bands of her voice using um, oscillators, using a, an oscillator bank. Uh, this is how it looked like. So I did like different, um, um number of different numbers of oscillators from one to i don't know how many like the maximum that the the the, the synthesizer itself uh, allowed for and then i did a composition kind of like going back and forth between more um like high hi-fi and more lo-fi versions of her voice and spatialize that in an eight channel composition so in the end, what you have is something that definitely sounds like a human voice, but technically it's not. So I was also probing, like stretching the limits of detectability of how we as listeners perceive a human voice to be human. Um, and having this uh, in the exhibition space, also being emphasized by the resonant frequencies of the room just made the whole thing like very, very interesting and very noisy in a, in a feedback kind of way, it just it just sounded way way more interesting than I envisioned, and it emphasized all the things that I wanted to be emphasized. So it was partly because of the uh, technical resources that I had available, but also some degree of luck into kind of okay, my guesses were more or less correct into that. So this is currently installed in Frankfurt, but nobody can see it because of COVID. 
and it's alongside like it's in three rooms this composition um, so in this headphones that you're seeing I have just her breathing then you go upstairs and then on this room you have these two subwoofers uh, just playing like very I, I overly emphasize like sub bass frequencies not necessarily from the recording itself but I kind of like did some feedback looks to feedback looks uh, feedback loops to emphasize those sub bass frequencies and I have this video playing I wanted to talk about that but it's not important um, and then you come to the main room which just has the loudspeakers and then you can just position yourself anywhere you want in the room and just have like this kind of moving around composition uh, playing with the limits of detectability of a human voice when in fact it's not necessarily a human voice what you hear is basically a bunch of oscillators trying their best to reproduce her voice her very accented voice at that so her own stretching of language plus the own stretching of the limits of listening and detectability of the human voice and I think we can listen to the pieces like three minutes and a half long and then we can end at that and then go to the conversation so I will say thank you already and enjoy the listen Okay, that's it. Thanks for listening. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Thank you so much, Pedro, for that lecture. Um, that last piece was quite quite spine tingling, actually, just thinking about the context and the the, um, the the story of the prodigal son and the deconstruction and the reconstruction and the, the kind of yeah. I think it leads on really nicely from the lecture so far. This term in thinking well we've kind of been circling this issue of a kind of politics of sound art and i think what is it's so striking about your research is how densely research ish it is and then seeing the questions or as you explained how to put that into art or as you said one of the reasons is simply because you've got the funding through art um but i think in a way it gives you a lot of freedom to yeah express or um yeah to kind of put those processes into some kind of form that is experienceable by by us um so much to to dig through so um i think we should have a, a quick break and then come back for um some questions for pedro i think you um should have a quick break as well so let's say i make it um 403 let's meet back here at 407 and we'll start with the q a I mean, there's been a question about your uh, your PhD and other publications, whether they're accessible online. So maybe you can answer that um, as a pre-question, right? It's on your website. OK, everyone else, please have a quick break and see you back here at seven minutes past. So we've got until half past four. I'm just trying to see if there's anyone else I can spot who's in this week's Q&A group, please do put your hand. I know you might not all necessarily speak and come on the mic, um, but I've made you all presenters. Those of you I can see. Tim. Um, yeah, would you like to go first, Tim? You should be able to turn on your microphone. Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah, I would like to say that was, um, I really liked your your approach to um, your work, I think is very unique compared to everyone else we've had so far. So it was very interesting. Um, uh, my question is, um, how important is sound to you in stimulating change and awareness of problems in the world? And do you think that sound arts will hold a more pivotal role in spreading messages in the future or does it already? Thank you. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I think, you know, there is like this tendency of positioning sound as kind of uh, allowing access or some kind of like this immediacy, the immediacy, sorry, this immediacy of sound or enough listening, which I'm not sure I espouse this vision. You know, I think, I think sound is a way of assessing a other ways of understanding how the world unfolds but not necessarily that it does 
more than other senses do. You know, I think that we, we tend to rely a lot on, on certain kind of hierarchy of the senses that I think sound and listening um, are not more important than any other engagement. So I think like, I would say that an attention towards the senses might reveal different things about the world and sound is just uh, listening just one of them sound what sound produces is in fact um as i said in the beginning it, it it's kind of it expresses and is at the same time a material engagement um about relationships of power in the world and i think that one way one way to approach this is that sound is basically another entry point but not that it reveals something that uh, is able to do more or less than any other senses would do. Um, in terms of what political change is, the, you know, it's, it's this idea that, you know, if you read, for instance, Jacques Attali, um, uh, Noise, like one of the quintessential sound studies books, uh, he would say that uh, sound kind of precludes and or forecloses history. Uh, and I think it is Fred Moten that says that sound actually anticipates history, but it does in a backwards motion, you know? So I think there is this kind of like, understanding that sound reveals something that is not immediately attainable, but at the same time, what it reveals is not necessarily the future, but rather allows us to access other parts of history that were perhaps neglected and allow, allow us to understand how the world unfolds in ways that have not been so far accounted for. And to, to the extent that that allows us to plan and to articulate a different future, but that sound Self is able to do that. I don't. I think it's to essentialize a little bit uh, the power of sound. One thing that I, I, when I, when I teach, I bombard my students with is that I insist on the idea that there is no primacy of sound. You know, sound is always informed by um, um, a material. A material oh, oh, I'm, I'm hearing myself, myself in feedback. feedback. Um, okay. Yeah. So sound. Um, sound always exists as a material engagement and an effective engagement with things. There is no, I, I believe that that's something that I more or less to my students is that uh, sound is never just sound, you know, and, and in that sense, it does, it does not do anything in and by itself unless we uh, apply some sort of agency or understand different agencies at play when sound uh, exists in the world, basically. Cool, thank you. That was a very, very good answer. Um, Annie, do you want me to ask any other questions or should we like get uh, other yeah. people to ask them? I'd, should we see if anyone else from your group wants to ask their question? And if sure. not, you, you could read someone's question out. Okay, Henry, cool. go ahead. Henry, would you like to, are you able to turn on your microphone I can't hear you Henry oh okay Tim maybe you could um, see if you can spot Henry's question and do us the honors unless anyone else from the group wants to come in yeah I can see if I can find this question thanks Tim do you have the link or do you... uh, yeah I've got the padlet here but um... okay Yeah, I can't see one that's named with him. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Henry, if you want to type in your question to the chat box, that might be a bit better. Can you read that? Um... Yeah. Um, so the question is, what is your philosophy on the ability to use language to determine someone's country of origin? Is it moral? Hmm. <laughs> um, okay, so let's, I will just avoid a little bit entering the, the, the idea of moral and, and, you know, like maybe, maybe to think in a different way is that to think that language says anything about anyone is already to make a lot of assumptions. Um, language is a product of our environments and it's really difficult to pinpoint where exactly language emerges. You know, for instance, my Brazilian Portuguese has mutated a lot since I moved abroad. 
and why you can still pinpoint me to Brazil, it's, it's not a statement, you know, exactly of who I am. You know, I am not defined by my nationality. I am not defined by the passport that I carry. And, you know, I'm not defined by the way my, my tongue moves inside my mouth when I produce sounds. So the problem for me is that it's not necessarily that language produces truth about someone, is that this is an instrument of power and the, the fact that this is used in fact to produce a truth that is external to yourself. So the body of an asylum seeker becomes evidence against the asylum seeker themselves. So in terms of morality or not, I mean, I would definitely be, go beyond that point and say that even the idea of borders is a moral question, you know, so this idea that, um, you know, that this idea that the country of origin determine, determines or does not determine your right to move is that what's immoral to begin with. You know, the la language is just a layer that is added on top of that as a way to kind of probe or to produce a certain degree of truth. Again, this idea of this essentialization of, of voice as connected to the body, um, that is what bothers me a lot in, in one of the reasons why I'm doing this research. But the question of morality, I think, extends beyond the, the use of language itself. I think it extends on the idea that a, someone's country of origin uh, is a determinant on whether or not they can move. So that's the moral question for me, I would say. Thank you. Um, so I'll just go on to ask some questions from the Padlet, Annie. Yeah, sure. I mean, oh, just you... just before that, can I just say something like uh, again on the questions? It's something that is important that I forgot. Um, sorry, I don't want to cut across. Um, one thing that's important in my research, and I think that's why I wanted to interrupt and say it uh, because I forgot to say, is that. A question often emerges like, oh, so you, do you think that we should improve these algorithms? We, we think that this recognition should be done better. And, you know, that's not what I'm saying. You know, I think that the rec recognition in itself is the problem, you know, that you can use these things to determine someone's uh, uh, rights is the problem in itself. So I, I'm not advocating for better recognition you know I'm advocating for the abolition of these practices and eventually of borders altogether so I, I think this is important to say so maybe that's why it's kind of it works maybe you have more freedom in an, in, a, in the context of working as an artist because if you were to apply for uh, I don't know like research council funds they might expect you to improve policy or improve procedures mm. that are in existence um, yeah um, I mean, not to be too simplistic about that. I just want to um, thank you, Tim, for offering to read the questions a few more. I just wanted to uh, point Pedro towards Lucy's question because it's related. How long were you working on this project and idea? Would you have been able to continue it without the residencies and research grants? That's a very good question and something that I wanted to mention uh, throughout the talk, but you know, I made myself a mess with, with time as always. But um, I've been working on this since 2017 and no, I would not be able to continue with, with residencies and research grants. And even so, you know, the fact that I was jumping from one grant to another uh, kind of hindered a little bit the process. You know, I think it could be this research that I've been doing, I went, I was able to go deep into that, to be quite honest, um, very recently, you know, my, the amount of information that I had about it. So if you see like my earlier projects that are on my website about this, so the one on Akud um, and the one in Brussels, the information that I had about these practices and these techniques and even the historical connections, it was very little because I didn't have the resources to do it. Um, in that sense, as I said in the beginning, like the material conditions also inform how I produce this work, you know. Also the idea that I did like radio work and this small performances was also a matter of budget, uh, meaning that if you see my work, is, you know, it's very lo-fi in nature and that's because I so far have mo have worked mostly without resources the most uh, or with very limited to say without is, is a is, is is a lie um but with very little resources the most um 
the, the biggest infrastructure I've ever had was with the Max Planck. And because Max Planck put a lot of money to doing this exhibition, it's not only my work, of course, but you know, like being able to measure the resonant frequencies in the room with a microphone that costs like 5,000 euros, you know, that's like a luxury. I, I would never be able to do that. Even the documentation with a dummy head, like really good binaural uh, setup that I had to document the piece, you know, so, of, and this is something that it's not often talked about is that, you know, it doesn't matter how, 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 good our ideas are you need resources to execute them and of course you can work your way around here and there and do a lot of you know lo-fi things and convey it but the more but one thing that grants and residencies allow you is time and you know it's just time to sit down read time to experiment you know the amount of time I've, I've spent experimenting in that studio in stockholm which is state owned by the way so the state owns that studio and you don't pay anything to be there and because i had this other residency by the swedish government i was able to be in the studio basically for four months so imagine having that bukla synthesizer available basically as much as i wanted to um, for four months nonstop. I have s almost 60 hours of recordings of this. You know, most of it is boring, but at least I could, you know, explore a lot in terms of how to treat the material. And about what Annie just said, like uh, about the political position, Germany occupies a very interesting space into that. I'm, I have many criticisms towards Germany. I do think it's a white supremacist state, you know, but. One thing I have to say is that public funding bodies seldom uh, kind of will nitpick on your political positions. So if you see my, my where I got grants from, all the grants that I got from the German government, I was very clear in where my research stands. So it was really brushing against practices done by the, the Federal Migration Office. So the Berliner Senat gave me a four month residence research grants to do that. The Max Planck Institute, which is also a public uh, institution, gave me funding to do that. Deutschland Funk Kultur, which is also state funded, gave me funding to do that. So in that, I am thankful that Germany still allows some kind of freedom to do research. And I, I understand when people have to kind of, um, no, let me phrase it in a different way. Um, I had never I never had to compromise my political views in order to be granted funding. I had to do that when I was doing my PhD research. I had to kind of fake my reports back to Brazil. I had funding from Brazil because if I mentioned that I was researching uh, racialized police violence, especially in the political tension that was happening in Brazil at the time when there was like the the uh, removal from, from Dilma, like the, damn it, what is it called in English? Like the a putsch, a golpe, I don't remember. Um, but when there was that happening, so if I mentioned that I was researching racialized police violence, I could have lost my funding. But Germany never asked me that. So that's that's also a privilege in a way or another. Yeah, it's super interesting when you're describing how the kind of multilingual um, element that you worked really purposefully with in that piece, because it was for, for kind of Deutschland Radio and it had to be, I think the end, I've worked with them myself. The end product has to be understandable to the German audience because it is state funded. Um, like you said, there's an English transcript on your website, which I did link to, but I think, yeah, working with that kind of, um, it was almost like a cacophony of, of voices and working, I suppose, with that um, opaqueness that comes through, like you said, not, not translating certain bits. Um, yeah, super fascinating. Um, should we go to Manoli's question? Um, Manali, would you like to come on the microphone or would you prefer me or Tim to read it out? Okay, maybe I'll read it out then. Um, so Manali says, thank you. Um, okay. No worries. Uh, fascinating body of work, particularly how you approach political and social issues through sound practice. My question is on your collaboration with the Greek singer. If we think that Greek and um, Portuguese poses a shared sonority to an extent, how do you think the piece would have turned out if you worked with a singer whose accent was more sonically distant to Portuguese? Mm, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think that maybe Greek and Portuguese from Portugal have more shared sonorities because 
uh, when I ask her, Emilia is her name, Emilia Varanaki. Um, um, when I ask her for the first time, how was her knowledge of Portuguese? Um, she she answers saying like, well, it's it's close to known. And she reported me saying that um, back like when she'd sent me her annotations that she had that she struggled a lot with very specific sounds. And if I worked with someone like I don't know who was a native speaker of Arabic or you know I don't know. Chinese, Japanese, whatever. Um, other languages that are like completely different from, from Portuguese or even, for instance, Finnish. Or I think it's just that the phonemes will be presented differently because I think um, her accent shows. And one of the things that I think is most interesting about this piece is that if you do not speak Portuguese, the level of fluency that she achieves goes be goes unnoticed you know because um it's something that it's only available if you're able to speak the language and identify the the moments in which her pronunciation slips because really like her pronunciation varies in the in the in the amount of like one two seconds from being super accurate to complete gibberish and this is really interesting in the way that she interpret those sounds as relating to their own to her own language um so in a way, I think any other language that is not like a, a, a romance language would have very different results. And I think Greek, um, maybe, I don't know, I don't know if, I, I don't understand Greek, but I do think that her, her Greekness also shows in the, in the recording, which I, I think even makes, even makes it more interesting that it inhabits this blurry zone between, you know, sounding Greek, sounding Portuguese, or sounding like nothing at all. Um, and for me, that was something that was a conscious decision on the piece was to retain that level of opacity in a sense that I don't explain in any other part of the piece that uh, the song um, that, you know, she's trying to sing something that she does not uh, have access to. And I do not explain the decisions that she takes. It's just that if you speak Portuguese or maybe if you speak Greek, you have access to a different level of the of the piece, but if you don't, you, you, if you don't speak, you don't have that access, and that's okay. You know, I, I one thing that I've been working a lot with is retaining this degree of understand of legibility, of being understandable, and not assuming that everything needs to be translatable and available all the time. Not even for me. Uh, like one thing that I forgot to mention is that uh, the the final part of series of gaps. Uh, the poem, the poem that uh, Leo reads and the verse that he created in Arabic, he didn't translate it to me. I don't know what he's talking. He just gave like a brief, um, like a summary of what he wrote. So yeah, I wrote a little bit about dialogues uh, that center around the home and language in the Arabic part. And he said the Kurdish poem was a revolutionary poem. So I also had to place trust in the people that I, that I was working with that they would uh, create something that was also meaningful to the piece. And I don't have access to that as well as the one who actually conceived the whole thing, because I also didn't want to, um, you know, eavesdrop on something that perhaps is not meant to be accessible to me. Thanks, Pedro. Thank you, Manoli. Um, I guess that reminds me of what you were saying about um, Edouard Glissant and this idea of opacity and the kind of um, the demand or the imposition of transparency all the time also has kind of colonial manifestations. So the resistance to being 100% transparent or like the kind of yeah default position of transparency, not to say transparency is bad or anything, but just to acknowledge that the default expectation of transparency always, you know, regardless of what power dynamics are at play is you know, to be want to be critically um, scrutinized. So I think we've got time for one more question. Does anyone from our student group want to choose one from the board um, or anyone from the audience? I think we'll have maybe one more question and then it'll be time to wrap up. Tim, can I ask you again? I'm sorry. Yeah. You're doing yeah, I don't mind asking one. That's cool. <laughs> you want to choose one from the board? Um. Uh, yeah, there's one from um, K. 
Kevin Hallamone, uh, and it says, um, how was your first experience with sound that inspired you to become an artist like you are now? Was it music or was it the ambience of your neighbourhood or surroundings where you grew up? Wow, uh, that's, hmm. I think my, I mean, what inspired me to, to become an artist, as I said, was um, also a product of my lack of resources in a way, but a, a, an interest, I think an interest from the get-go into exploring things that were extending beyond musical practice. So I, I, I was always like a very musical person, which is weird because I have no musicians in my family. But I remember like uh, working, um, uh, my, my dad was working as a journalist uh, when, I was, when I was a kid. And this was back in the 80s. And then he had one of these dictaphones. And I remember as a kid kind of stealing his dictaphone and doing my own recordings uh, to his rage. Uh, it was kind of ruining his work materials but uh, um, that I mean that's my first sound experience and you know I don't I don't look back at that thing like oh that's the my origin story but I I see that as kind of pinpointing that I always had an interesting sound so to speak but what inspired me to become an artist was not necessarily something like very poetic or very romantic it was basically that um, I I grew up as a metal kid and I started playing guitar when I was 12 and I wanted to do, I wanted to study music, but my parents could not support me like financially uh, to do music. Um, so I had to choose something else and I chose graphic design because with graphic design I could work. But I was, as I said, I was lucky enough that I, I studied in a university that had one or two professors there really going deep into what design meant and what design could be. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I had this whole, you know, Marxist and post-structuralist uh, education in, at university. So I was reading or trying to, because I don't think I would under, I was understanding that much, but I was reading Deleuze when I was 18 and trying to make sense of all the things that some professors were talking about. And at one point, one, one professor mentioned a book by R. Murray Schaefer of all people, which is someone that I, I'm not very fond of these days. Uh, but I, I remember reading The Tuning of the World and you know being completely fascinated that you could talk about sound in that way. And I remember talking to one of my professors and then and then he said, Well, I mean, there's a lot more you can do with sound that does not concern music, and there's a lot more that you can do that actually pertains to a design look at things. So from that moment on, I think I decided that, you know, I only wanted to work with sound because I couldn't see myself doing anything else. I worked a little bit as a graphic designer. I think I liked what I did, but you know, it's not it's not something that moves me, you know, it's not something that I actually have the guts to sit down and work for hours at large. So it was really like, um, um, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but um, uh, I think, you know, it was basically, I would say it was a combination of these two things, you know, me having always this kind of inherent interesting sound uh, and then finding avenues at which I could do work on it. And then, you know, if you see like my work, it doesn't fit quite well into the category of sound art as it's traditionally understood. It's because I still don't know how to do it, you know, and I'm still figuring out how to express the things that, that interest me when it comes to what sound does. You know, I'm not interested in, I'm not interested in sound as sound. I'm interested in so what sound does. And for me to figure out that simple thing, it took so many years. And it was a lot of um, also deconstructing things that I thought I knew about sound, including uh, Murray Schaefer's writings, you know, that kind of essentialize a lot of things about sound. And that's exactly what I would recommend to read Murray Thompson's book. Um, but, you know, I think it's a combination of those two things. And to a certain extent, I, for, for a long time, I defined myself as a frustrated musician, but I stopped doing that and I stopped and I started, you know, considering myself, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a musician in my own terms, you know, <laughs> so that's kind of where it, where it comes from. 
Okay, I'm afraid we'll have to wrap up there. Um, but thank you so much, Pedro. Um, I just thank wanted you. to comment briefly just how how much I appreciate this kind of the the consistency with which the kind of element of materiality is present in your work, like all the way from the stuff you talked about at the beginning, the kind of materiality of the voice or of sound and the way that it um, enforces this kind of relational um, perspective or um, yeah, how it foregrounds relations right through to, you know, you being quite explicit about the funding and, you know, what, what funds want and the kind of lived material, mm -hmm. almost kind of bread and butter of um, what people can do as practitioners. And that's something that actually in this um, seminar we had right from the beginning, kind of thinking about art funding and the kind of politics of that also is it different mm -hmm. across different countries. So um, thank you so much for such a rich lecture and thank you to um, our student um, group for the questions and also our audience yes. for asking their questions too. Um, yeah, fantastic. Thanks so much again for coming and sharing your work and I'm sure uh, people can go on your website to see more um, and read more of your, your and listen to more of your work. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thanks to all the questions. They were really, really good questions. I think it, it, it allowed me to touch on things that I, I didn't remember talking about. So thank you so much. Thanks for the work you're doing as well. It's really nice. <laughs>